请坐，坐这里。Very good. So, yeah. What's Eric? Oh, so my name is Eric. So Eric, together with Jin Xian. Uh, no, it's sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so He's saying that you're very kanchong, don't you kanchong? Yeah, sorry. So I just you know, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we just take it as a chit chat session. We have a group of community whereby like to learn about investing. They are in their career, maybe their earlier career stage, yeah. like myself and Jin, like Jia Xuan is like twenty thirties. So we got a lot of things to learn from you. And then we like to share this to our community. Exchange of information and exchange of experience. There will be things that I will know better than you guys because of my age and the things that I've done. But there are also things that I can learn from you guys. It's like the youthfulness, the IT aspects of things. Is mm. The lost. So, That's so, not so true. Well. From the company direction wise, I went through all the annual reports. I read all, all your it message. I can see the transition from the clean up, build up to take up stage. Mm -hmm. So the take up stage is things that we also want to do, mm -hmm. but we face a lot of challenges. I guess integrity is one key thing. And then also the fact about an honor to continue delivering what you promise your shareholders. This is all part of it. Mm -hmm. Especially admirable on the stuff that in the 2014, mm -hmm. there's an interview that wrote about you're taking over the company mm. and then you like to take care of shareholders. Yes, it was a paying it forward kind of moment right mm. at that point of time. Because <clears throat> we came in because at that point the company was insolvent. The liquidators that is uh, liquidating high frogs today was already in the company going through the files. Mm. So the banks have already <clears throat> appointed the liquidator into the company. So it's very much game over mm -hmm. at that point of time. But for some reason, this company, big part of the shareholders were senior citizens and old folks. So a lot of them were, were crying actually and mm. because they're going to lose a lot of their life savings. In the early days, they, a lot of them used their CPF to, to buy the shares. So when we came on board, or at least when I joined the company at that point of time, is to at least give them hope. I think in the early years when I joined the company, is like if you read my interviews before, mm. it was really nothing. This is basically a paying forward. My contract those days was no difference from the receptionist. There's basically no contract. <clears throat> I just hold a responsibility of about to bankrupt the company. There's no upside. In fact. The conditions when I joined those days is I have to still lend money to the company at no interest and no security to pay some salaries. So that's about it. I don't know how to put in words. I, I don't know generalize youngsters <coughs> like, like myself. Mm. When we see legacy stuff, mm. my first impression is like, why am I taking over legacy stuff that like it's not due to me? Well, I guess if you look at it, it's like if it's a paying it forward, then that itself it really sounds explanatory. I always tell people that I'm uh, a working CEO, which I'm still am. I'm not a founder CEO, but I thought. The key to me is I came in while the company was in Dark Street. So just want to bring back some hope to the shareholders. So I think in one of my year, I think the AGM, I think the caption was, uh, it all started with a promise. Mm. And and we have delivered that promise and basically that, that is how, how it all started. So on your question is why do I take up that kind of responsibility? I guess I say it's making a difference. I mean all of us come to this world is a journey, it's a process and it's a journey. We come naked, we'll be living this world naked and at the end of the day is what we really going to leave behind to the people is the memories. <clears throat> who you are as a person when you are around and not so much on how much money you have in your banks which not everybody would know and or how powerful you are because all this will eventually disappear with times when you, you, you pass on but what will always remember will be who you are and what you did mm. while you are around and to me I think that is an important thing I think <coughs> it's making a difference in people's lives so I, when I just joined this company it's very interesting because I only have about what in Singapore, it's about two staff or three because most of them left, so you know, two or three. Those days, go around telling everyone this, this is a social enterprise in a shell of a public listed company because we are what we are. And 
I went around asking for a lot of help from friends. Um, we had our website done for free. We have our legal advice was free. So it's all through friendships and all this stuff. And I have my staff that actually join me those days when I recruit people to come and join us. So I say, you know, I mean, I can't pay you the kind of salary that you're getting because the company is really solvent. In fact, most of them, you have to take a huge pay cut to join me. And I can't promise you a career because I don't even know if the company will still be around tomorrow. But at least for once in your life, you can say that you have done something that is not for oneself, it's not for yourself, it's not about pay, it's not about career, but it's to make a difference in someone else's life. Mm. I mean, it don't have to be forever, it can be for just half a year, for a year, a lot depending on your comfort level. But there's one thing I can guarantee, I mean, I can give you and I can guarantee that you will have, and that's an, an adventure. Mm. And they was asking me those days, what kind of adventure? Oh, your colleague got kidnapped last month. What? And, 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 <laughs> what? And, and, and they were like, are you kidding? They thought I was just pulling their legs and kidding. I said, no, 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 it's absolutely true, because my country hit a Singaporean that's based there, was kidnapped. All the farms are in countryside, so the the law is definitely not so effective. Mm. And then the local mafias. Eventually, we have to find ways to, to rescue him. Wow. It must be a very tough process. Well, well, I mean, in the early days, this is a very... I mean, being a public company, everything about us is so public. Like, the company is in trouble, the whole world, no? there's mm. nothing we can hide about it. So, the farms that we had those days, all the local will know that the company can no longer have the ability to protect its mm. own assets and they will come and try to grab mm. the, the, the assets and at that point of time it's basically it's about muscles it's like the wild wild west and, and, and that was why it is we got no money we got no influence we got no power we got nothing the company is about the bankrupt so I remember in one of my meetings with one of the local tax in one of the farms so they are talking about we have so many farms so in one of them I was put in this little hut alone and then next moment I know that I was surrounded by a bunch of guys in, with tattoos all over and give it about give take five minutes or so but the five minutes felt like an hour then the big boss walked into the hut and and he came right in front of me said in front of me and we were parang about this long slap it on the table and say, so how you want to negotiate? You know, when I share all the stories to my friends here in Singapore and they will, they will say that, you know, are you really Singaporean? I say, yes, I am, 100%. I, I'm born here, I'm, I, I grew up here, I served the army. I say, aren't you afraid? It's like, like you said earlier, the, the rule of law is weak in this kind of countryside and that's in the early years and they could literally chop you into pieces and throw you into the sea. And, mm. Who's to know? Yeah. Aren't you afraid? And it got me thinking actually. It's like, if this is a career that I was doing prior to my retirement, and I think a question will definitely come out when I'm in that situation, and that is, is this all worth it? And I, I, I'm absolutely sure that the answer would be, I'll tell my son, I think it's worth my own safety. No, but strange enough is that in that incident, the question never pop up, probably because I've made a promise to, to the shareholders. And through this whole thing, I realized that sometimes in life, if you're doing something that is above oneself and, and, and not for anything, you find a certain strength within yourself that you didn't even know you have it. That was what happened. I was very calm, I was very composed. Funny thing is that years down the road, that very mafia hit that slammed on the parang is my shareholder. So oh, the way okay. I look at it is that how to get, how I was telling myself, how to get free productions, make them part of us. <laughs> so I convinced him to be a shareholder. So of course, you know, now he's happy because he makes money. Mm -hmm. And I recently I was in China and he hosted me lunch and then he says, you can still remember how we met in the beginning. I said, of course I remember, you tried to intimidate me. I said, no, you scared us all. I said, are you kidding me? You guys surround me with a whole bunch of tattoo guys and then you slap a car in front of me and you say, I scare you? He said, yes. After you left that hut that day, we talked among ourselves. He says, you know, we did everything and this guy is so cool and composed. He must have some connections at federal level. Don't touch him. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes in life, it's very strange, right? But I guess the truth to the matter is that I learned from the process mm. as much as I'm paying it forward, but in some way, I also learned a lot from me is that when you did it for 
a bigger purpose and, mm -hmm. and you found a certain strength within yourself. And mm -hmm. that certain strength will then it will actually radiate to, to other people. I have staff who actually joined me. They took a 40% pay from big MSCs. And then two weeks after they joined me, EY actually heard that she came and offer her a job, thinking that Oceans must have paid her more. So Tara says that, you know what, whatever you were being paid previously, you could join EY, we will pay you 50% above oh. your last job. Mm -hmm. So two weeks after she joined me, she came to my room and said, boss, I got this off. I look at her and I say, wow, so now the difference is 90%. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you know what, you're only here for two weeks. If you want to go, I can perfectly understand. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fine with it. And she just tell me, say, you know what, boss? I just came in here to tell you, say, I have demand, but my job here is not done. And mm. she left the room. Wow. And until now, she's still here. My liquidator is also now my CFO. That's why sometimes it's very strange. You kind of influence the, the other people. They, they were on the opposite camp, and they came by and they start to, to, to work with you. I read one of the interviews. You told your staff, is like, prioritize your health, Prioritize your family, yeah, yeah. only then like business or career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you put yourself like above all these three? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you think about it, like, I always tell, we, we are here to pay it forward, right? Mm. So, how to pay it forward if you don't have a health? Mm. How to pay it forward if you don't have family support? And so, to me, it's first, of course, your own health and then the family and, and then the work. It's just mm. a job. Of course, we have to be committed to it, but the point is, if you can't take care of the earlier two, is how can you do the rest? See, the funny thing is that, like I say in early days, this company was formed by a lot of people who came in because mm. they want to pay it forward like me. So, I have a problem getting them to go home and rest. I got mm. a problem getting them to take a break. So, wow. that's why I have to set the kind of rules because they will never, you know, they can have leave and they never claim and then the HR will force the leave on them. And then they'll just apply the leave and continue to work. I have to enforce on certain, certain rules that you know. The culture here is so different <laughs> for what I know. I was like, like clock, five o'clock, <coughs> I want to go home already. It's different. I guess it's the until this very day is like now the company has grown a lot, like you said earlier. Mm. The culture remains to be like one big family. Uh, every one of us will come around and be there's no rank. I mean I told them it's like you respect me for my role, I respect you for your role. There's no bosses or no bosses here because we are all here to do our job and and that's why yeah. and basically it's even uh, you know, there's not really no rank. We will we will talk, we will joke with anybody. Only when it comes to work we are serious with whatever we are doing. But beyond that yeah. I think that's kind of interesting things that happening because just now you mentioned, oh, there isn't like influence power, there's no like things that attract people to stay. Mm. But what you have all mentioned just now is that people just follow you. Of course I have to qualify, I mean that was in the early days. Today mm. the company is a very different company than it was. I mean, um, if, I, if I still say we were just a social enterprise, then I guess people will probably joke about it a lot mm. and you know it's not real. However it is, it's like the, the culture remains very much entrenched to the, the, the whole company. So the company to this very moment is still very much like, you know, it's like when we, we last week we have a Christmas party and it's like we really dress down and everybody will will, will have real fun. There's no such thing as a, a boss or no boss. It's mm. like we just play and let our hair down and that kind of stuff. But of course, when it comes to work, we are all dead serious. So, so there's always a very divine line drawn in the sense that if we are working, we work. Mm. If we are not working, then we are all friends and colleagues. And, mm. Mm. and that's the, how the culture is. Yeah, so for the past nine years, like you have built this culture, you have built this company. <laughs> mm. Is there any moment in time you say, wow, I, I shouldn't risk my time or risk my life. No, I mean, if you, if you read my earlier uh, things, mm. I did mention that, you know, when I reach a point whereby I kind of the three stages and then I will think I deliver my job and I'll go. I have been, been interviewed and says that you said that before, so does it mean that you're about to retire? I said, look, I mean, as much as I have said whatever I said before, the point is, it's a journey like I said earlier. And I'm still enjoying that journey and also enjoying that whole commodore people coming together and trying to make a difference. 
And, and where we are today is, is just the start of that digitalization process. So can I say that we are there already? Maybe not because the three years COVID kind of hold back a certain flow. So right now we are basically back on track and we are still working on towards that goal. Mm. And life is basically about finding that path and being happy about it. Now that I'm very happy here and why mm. should I think otherwise? I see that you have been very just now I want to see any moment of time you were giving up. <laughs> but it seems like for the past nine years, there isn't a moment that happened. No, happens. no, no, it's just, it's just no time. Yeah. Uh, because to us, we do something, it's not about just a routine thing. Mm. It's about making a big difference. Mm. So when I joined the company then, nobody, nobody, including all my, my friends, my close friends, my family, no one believed that this company can be safe. So to us, or at least to me at that point of time, that become a, a challenge. Yeah. It's close to, to a hundred billion. That. Yes, yeah. yes. So how do we, and there's a lot more than that. In mm. other, we have six months of pay, unpaid salary, three months of... Uh, I'll give you an example. <coughs> how bad this thing was also when I joined. When, when, when I joined this company, I was the first CEO to implement the rule that starting with me, we will stay in the farm. Prior to me, there's no bosses from Singapore will go to the farm and stay in the farm. So it's usually they stay in a hotel, and that's about three, four hours from the farm. I implement that you got to walk the talk. You need to know what's happening on the ground. You cannot just depend on people telling you. Because of that, that's why my country head will have to stay in the farm. So everybody mm. stays in the farm because starting with me. Mm. So those days when it was tough because there are times there's no water, there are times there's no electricity, there are times there's no internet. So there are times when I go, they say, boss, there's no water supply. I say, then be it. It's like we go through army, there were time in field camp, there's no showers, right? So I say, if everybody else is going to go through it, I'll go through it. Otherwise, how do you command respect on the mm. ground? You know, my second week in the farm in my first month, that was where I just joined the company. You know, you want to call Murphy's Laws to the, the max, that was what happened. Then. I was surrounded by about a few hundred people in you know, the farm and, and angry mob. You, you guys, I remember, have experience working overseas. When you're in those kind of like countryside and when they have an angry mob, they mean business. You can be beaten up and hospitalized. I was confronted by this angry mob. I was re- literally in the center of it. And they're none other than my staff. How do you react then? The only things that I can think of is like, the Hong Kong movie yeah, go yeah, outside. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not <laughs> like Hong Kong movie because they are not being paid and for the longest time they only know the boss's name, they don't even know how it looks like. And for me, for the last two weeks, I've been sitting with them in the canteen, eating there and I, I usually run around or ride the bicycle around to really know what's happening on the ground. So they know me after two weeks. Obviously, I'm the target number one. <clears throat> they surrounded me because they demand a pay. You can imagine that when I joined this company at that point, when I came in and Certain of the records were not there because they say the typhoon has swept everything away. I, I come in kind of blind. There's a lot of problems. So I was surrounded by them. In the midst of trying to calm the cloud, my, my finance guy, we go to the cloud and come to me and say, that boss, we have a problem. And I say, I know we have a problem. Can't you see I'm in the center of the problem? They say, no, boss, I'm not referring to this one. I said, what do you mean I'm not referring to this one? I said, oh, we have a group of angry mob local mafias. They are banking on a gate and literally with parangs and rods. What should we do? Should we open the gate? I said, no, we shouldn't open the gate. Why are they doing that? I said, oh, they say we owe them money. I said, don't open the gate. Let me settle this problem here. And then I said, boss, that's not wrong. I said, what do you mean not wrong? I said, oh, our farm next door, the police and the court officials are there. I said, why are they doing that? Oh, they're seizing the farm. I said, why are they seizing the farm? Oh, because we before you joined the company, we have 40 over legal case and because the previous management didn't do anything, so we lose every one of them. So now the court officials and police are next door seizing the farm. You know, before I could even come out and say, I'm only two weeks old in the farm. You know, I'm just my first month in the company. And my phone rang and my staff from Singapore was on the other side of the, the phone and said, boss, do you need me to pack your stuff inside a box? I said, can you choose a better time? To ask me such a silly questions and with such trivial things. Mm. Do you know what I'm facing right now? And then my staff over there and say, boss, it's not trivial, it's serious. I say, what do you mean by serious? Packing some stuff in a box is serious? He say, yes, we just got an eviction notice by the landlord. So if I don't pack your stuff, by the time you're back from China, you cannot retrieve it. So you need me to pack for you. 
And before I even can say anything, say, boss, are we going to get our salary end of the month? So you can imagine for someone who knows nuts, and I was retired before they were having a hell of a life, within a month, I was transformed in the central of this whole epic center. And with no inclination of farming, no inclination of how even we got to this mess. And this is how bad it was. At that moment, it does strikes and cross my mind is that, you know, what am I doing here? A month ago, I was still traveling around the world mm. and having a good time. Is that what I'm doing here? But I guess if it's not because of that notion that I'm here to make a difference in, in, in many people's lives, I don't think I'll be doing mm. it because none of the mess was created by me. I don't even know how it happened and I don't have any material to read about it. When you mentioned like before that, you are having a good life and then yeah. pull back in, into a mess that you couldn't even trace back what happened back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I also read like the reason you going to a hiatus to enjoy is also because of family. I think I read one of the articles that you are in a plane, oh, you're okay, writing okay, a okay. note. I, I, I guess that one is a, that's way back. So in that one flight, I was flying to Hong Kong and for me it was a, a, just a turn around, having a meeting and come back. Somehow or other that flight we were caught in the typhoon and the plane was shaking badly. Mm. But I was sleeping because for me at that point of time I travelled so often that it really doesn't matter, that doesn't bother me and mm. I slept. And I was woken up by this air stewardess and she passed me a paper and a pen and I look at her and a day and I was sleeping and I never asked for anything. And she just looked at me and smiled and said, it's like just for you to scribble something. Mm. And then she walked away and I see her giving that to every passenger. Now you guys got to remember this is not a handphone era. And that's where I told myself, oh this is bad. This time is really bad. I mean, long and short, anyway, we caught a typhoon. So that day, we got out of the typhoon and we landed in Taiwan. When we land on Taiwan, you can imagine the, the scream, the, the, the cry, the, the, the laughter was tremendous. Mm. And, and then this, this Caucasian guy who was sitting next to me suddenly turned to me and said, So, what did you write, buddy? And I look at him in the days, I say, You know what? You look at my face, it's blank. I still haven't get over this all whole ordeal and, and, and I show you the paper and my the piece of paper is also blank. And I think, what about you? What here? And he showed me his paper and, and having gone through that whole episode, he showed me that piece of paper. It, it resonated quite a fair bit. Two nights, simple. First night is honey, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have quarreled with you this morning over the packet of shoe. And the second night is Daddy is so so sorry. I should have kept to my promise and bring you guys to the zoo. So I read that and then then he tell me, he said, you know what, I'm supposed to be on Hong Kong to sign a multi-million dollar deal. So this morning when I left my home to the airport, my wife was asking me, says, have you re forgotten to get the packet of sugar I asked you to? And she said, he forgotten because he's working over the weekends on this multi-million dollar deal that he's about to go to Hong Kong to sign. So then there was this argument, the wife was unhappy and he said he was so angry because it's like, you know, I'm doing a multi-million dollar deal and you're pouring me over this packet of sugar and that kind of stuff. So that's how he left the home, so he was very unhappy. Mm. And, and for the children, because exactly the same thing, because he's working over the weekend to rush through the projects and the, the details and he couldn't bring them to the zoo as he promised. So then he says that, but when I was given that piece of paper and a pen, I would have thought that our what comes to my mind and my thoughts would be, I'm going to miss the signing of the multi-million dollar deal and would it be jeopardized and blah 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 and so on and so forth. But it just never came into my mind. It's like, in fact, the thing that come to my mind is all the trivial stuff that happened, like the pack out of sugar, breaking my promise to my kids, but not the multi-million dollar deal. So, and then he continued saying, you know, it's so strange. Before anything happened, all those things were so trivial. But when, at that point when I thought I would never live to see the next day like, all those trivial stuff suddenly become so important and they keep coming in, crashing back in my memory again and again. In fact, the multi-million dollar deals was not even near there. I asked myself, is that if something happened that day, and, uh, would I live to regret it? And I think the answer to me obviously is, yeah, because there's a lot of things I want to do, I've not done it. We always procrastinate in life and we say there's always tomorrow. And I say, what if I didn't live that day, nothing would happen. After that episode, I decided to retire and sell the business and do the, all the things that I always say that I wanted to do, but I just couldn't find the time. There are many times when we meet friends in the street and say, oh, let's catch up, but that catch up never happened. Mm. So that five years, I travel all over the world. I, I, I stay in my friend's house in Estonia, in their summer home. Mm. I went to Melbourne, have lunch my friends. I, I go over the world meeting all my friends. I, I, I did all the crazy stuff. I, I love 
adventure sports and everything. So I did everything. So when I finished at five years, and how I come to Oceans is that now that I've done what I wanted to do, I'm at peace with myself. What should I do and what can I do? If I wanted to do something, it should be do something for a better good and it have to be a, something that would make a difference. So I wasn't looking for a job. I wasn't looking for anything. In fact, I'm looking to do something whereby if I can be a there to make a difference and that something that is meaningful. Now this is very meaningful. In my maiden speech as a CEO uh, many years ago, I stood on stage. The first thing that I properly say, this company is sick. Mm. And until and unless we admit and accept that we are sick and do something about it, we are not going to recover. I remember that day I came down from the stage, my eye was saying, boss, you can't say things like that in your maiden speech. As a public company CEO, the first thing that comes from your mouth is your company is very sick. I say, I told him, I said, I'd like to call a spade. The spade is what it is. I don't want to bid around the push. And then that day after that, I, I laid down my plan, which you already read, the clean up, the build up, and the, the tech up. So this has been there all these years. I mean, I've never changed it. So I said, this is the plan. And at the end of my speech, there's this old man who put up his hand and he said, you know, Mr. CEO, I'm very happy to be here this afternoon because you're the first CEO to properly admit that we have a problem. And you're also the first CEO to give us a really stake short and long-term plan of how to get ourselves out of this whole predicament. But I have a question for you, Is Then I asked him, what is your question? He said, can you guarantee us all this poor shelter that at the end of the day, our problem will be over? So there are about, about two, three hundred people there that day in the auditorium. I look at them and say, and I say, <coughs> I can't guarantee you because I do not have crystal ball to look into the future. But I can guarantee you one thing. And the one thing I can guarantee you is Better we get ourselves out or not of all this whole audio. At the end of the day, I can stood up in front of you and look into you into your eyes and say that I've done my best. I'm here today not because I needed this job, but because of you guys. Mm. And, and that's why I'm here. Mm. So with that, he was happy with the answer. He, 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 stood, he sat down and, and everyone started crap. So that's why in one of my, 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 my age year, we say you know, it all started with a promise and, and we have delivered. That's basically how it resonated. I can share with you a little bit more. In fact, um, I told you guys the liquidator was already in the company, the creditors was in the company. So obviously, if you all do read about it, I was a shareholder proud to that. So I, I, I took a position before I joined the company. They were asking, why, why did I actually sell all the shares then? I said, well, I mean, if this is going to be a social enterprise and I'm going to get all my friends to help, I wouldn't have the audacity to tell my friend to help. And in the event, if the company do make it and I get to gain, I say, it's just monetary room. Hmm. So I said, I, I cannot hold any shares. Of course, when I so those days, I would take a massive loss. I think about two years later, when we actually took back all the pumps, one day my creditors and my liquidators came to my office then, and they say that, <coughs> this, um, you know what, Peter, you joined this company all, all this while, and you never asked for anything. There's no contract, there's no nothing. Hmm. And, and we really like to thank you for what you're doing and that's really nice of you. And when you sold your shares those days and say what you say, we take it with a pinch of salt. But after two years, we've seen all these people who came forward to, to pay for it like you. We thought that was very honorable of you. So today we would like to come here to give you a reward. So that's very nice. What do you have in mind? He said, oh, Peter, we we're going to give you 30% of this company. No question. Huh? So I said, oh, this very nice. Then I asked them straight away, I said, what about the uncles and aunties? And I remember very vividly one of them, it's like one Hong Kong and one Aussie. And the Hong Kong was saying, he showed me this sign, because the cake is only so big. And I straight away get the drift. And then they continue to say, we are the major creditors, the two of us combined, and this company is going to default, and we're going to take this company. You continue to be a CEO, and then we're going to list in Hong Kong, because they are very big in Hong Kong. We're going to list in Hong Kong, and you will continue to be a CEO, and we'll give you 30% of this company, no questions. By the time they finish restaurant, they say, no, I can't. Mm. And it's funny that Hong Kongers are saying, period, 30% too little, we can negotiate. Yeah. I say, you're missing a point, right? I say, especially coming from professionals like you guys. I mean, if I came in for the money, I will have demand a contract right from day one. Mm. Yes. I mean, just like you guys, if you deliver, that's what you get. If you don't deliver, you're still going to get something. Mm. Unlike now, it's like nothing. Whether I deliver or I don't deliver. So, I say, I came in, you know from day one, it's because I want to pay it forward, it's for the uncles and aunties. And you're telling me that, you know, it's like, it, we skim off. I say, I can't. I say, remember what I tell the uncle, that, you know, 
at the end of the day, whether I deliver it or not, I, was, I can stand in front of you and look get you right into your eyes and say, I've done my best. Now, if I take the 30% today, when I see that uncle on the street, I probably got to quickly turn around and walk away. Mm-hmm. And, and all the shareholders. I and see there's a lot of like leadership leading this company. Mm-hmm. But aren't you also think like you are sacrificing too much? No, I don't think you're sacrificing because I say, how, how you sacrifice when you are aware of the fact that eventually when you finish your journey here, you're going to go off naked. You're not going to take anything away with you. And that's a fact. Yeah, and that's a fact that you can't change. And I say, you two were sitting on the first row when I say that. That day in the auditorium. Mm. Now, you are here not to give me a reward, I told them. I say, you are here offering to buy my integrity. And I was just telling you in a very nice manner that it's not for sale. And the Hong Kong guy got so pissed off. He said, oh, you're such a pain in the ass, Peter. He said, you know, every time you put your uncles, your aunties, fine, we know we need you. And because you took back all the farms and these are the old very assets the company have at that point of time, and without you, the farm will be taken away by all the mafias again and, and, and we have really nothing. So we, you know and I know that we need each other. Mm. Fine, we offer you a way out and it's a clean way and it's a nice rewarding way. You refuse to accept. Now, as much as we would like to negotiate and restructuring with you, but we cannot. Why? Because, right, you, like we said earlier, you don't have a contract. So what does that mean? You can tender your resignation and in 30 days you can walk. And you have got no shares in the company, so you got no skin in the game. So how are we going to negotiate a restructuring of this magnitude with a CEO that can walk in 30 days and got no skin in the game? Mm. Now, we are not about to give you any contract. So the only other way for you is you put in fresh money and be a shareholder mm. of this company all over again. So I thought for a moment and I said, okay, I'll do it. And, and that's where the Aussie guy said, Peter, are you hearing us correctly? We say that if you put in money again and be a shareholder, a significant shareholder again, we will talk to you and negotiate. We never promise you anything beyond that. So in the event if the negotiation fails, this will be the second time you're going to throw your money in the drain. I say, well, I'm aware. I mean, if you're telling me that if I don't have to do that and you are willing to negotiate, I'll be so happy uh, but I can buy you a nice dinner tonight. But if you're telling me you can't and given the reason you've given me, I can't dispute it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and if I allow that to happen and let you two walk away, so I say, those friends of mine who came in to do promonos and my staff who took huge pay cut to join me and when they found out that one day the company didn't succeed because there was this moment that I was put on the spot and I walk away from it, I said I'll lose all my friends because I lose all my credibility. Mm-hmm. I got them to sacrifice, but they come to me, I, I, I walk away. Mm-hmm. So I said, I can't accept your 30% because it's integrity. I cannot don't reinvest because it's credibility. Mm-hmm. So, so it's very funny. It's, 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 sometimes in life, it's, it's, it's strange. I start off in this company as a uh, shareholder. Mm. Then I, by choice, I become a non-shareholder. Then def- by default and force, I become a shareholder again. So that's basically how mm. it goes. Oh, I, although you didn't see it as sacrifice, but I think there's a lot of effort, hard work that you put into this. So how do you take care of yourself? That I'm always very happy. Yeah. My staff all as well always see me. And even Chin Sen also, my friend here, they always say, why am I always so happy? Why am I not happy? Why, why do I find it a sacrifice? First, yeah. I say, I didn't cause this mess. So it's not my problem to begin mm. with. I came in here to do help. So when you're helping people, why is there things to be unhappy about? Mm. And, and I don't look at that as a sacrifice. I look at that as an honor, actually. You see, it's through this journey I meet a lot more new friends and through this journey I find that inner strength within like I shared earlier and through this journey during the COVID period I have those uncles and aunties making cakes for us and all this stuff I even have one uncle coming out to the office those days asked to see me and then when I came out they say thank you and he walked away I was like, what's this? And I chased him over to the leaf. I said, uncle, 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 you don't come here and just say thank you and go, right? Then he just turned around and said, after all you have done, I don't think it's respectful to just call you and say thank you. And all these things, it's it, 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 very emotional. Mm. So when we finally got this whole thing out of the, the situation, 
and I have so I was standing on the stage that year and I said, that gentleman who asked me the question three years ago, are you here? And he put out his hand and said, today I'm telling you we've done it. And I can tell you at the end of the, the AGM, everyone dashed off to the stage and started grabbing us. All my management, myself, and they just hugged us and, and then, and with tears rolling down the chair, I said, thank you. And I can tell you that is something that money cannot buy. It will go way down deeper than just having a bit of money in your pocket or is it something that you resonate through and through. There's this, this article I, th I thought it was so real and so true. I will share with you guys. What's the meaning of life? When a person is born, he has breath but no name. And when he dies, he has a name but no breath. The gap between the breath and name is life. Get it? Life is a question which nobody can answer. And death is an answer which nobody can question. Hence, enjoy the question till you get your answer. It's just all truth in it. I may not be the richest person, but I'm happy and I enjoy every moment. If the same thing happens like what happened many years ago in the plane, at least I can say safely or I'll, I'll, I'll go with a smile and with no regrets because I did everything I want to do and every day I'm enjoying the journey, I'm enjoying that fun. Of course, today the company is no longer in the situation whereby we, we used to be, but that would not stop us from what we started off this journey and our DNA. Just a few months back, we organized a lunch for about 800 old folks. So every table, we have one of our staff hosting them. So we have about 80 tables. The staff will also go up to the stage to perform. One of my staff wrote a song and she's performed and sang. I'll get <coughs> a lot of media corp artists mm. and they did for more. It's a lot of fun. Mm. So to us, we still want to move forward and continue that that journey that we, how it all started us. Today, we are definitely not a company that is insolvent. In fact, we are actually a growing company and there's so much things that we're doing. When I came in, no one said it's possible. This company is over, it cannot be saved. So we thought to ourselves that nothing is impossible in this world and, and especially we came in with a right attitude and right mindset. So we make that happen. When three years down the road, the company was saved, and then at that point, I remember standing on the stage and say, this company is like a big ship. There's no longer in any danger of sinking because we have patched all the holes over the last three years. But it's drifting aimlessly in the sea and there's no sail, there's no engine. Other than we have got ourselves out from all these depths. We are just abalone farming and we're just in one country. And I say, no company will be able to survive if it's just one product, one country. Mm. So I said I have to transform this company. That's why I implemented the four pillars of growth and we created the whole business as what we are today. And at that point when I say that on the stage, people say, don't be kidding, Peter, you are a, a farmer. So people also feel that it's impossible for a farmer to be transformed. Mm. But you come to the office today, you see that we are anything but a farmer today. We are in, in all kinds of distributions mm. and we are in farming still. And then we are in media, we are in logistics. We have our own bonded warehouse. We are in this uh, fintech, uh, we have major payment license mm -hmm. and we are doing everything. So we have already finished that stage. So I guess now we are embarking on our third phase, which is digitalization. Mm -hmm. So we hope at the end of this journey, the company is not only known in Singapore, but it's known internationally. And that's what we are hoping to be, the, the, the next big thing. And to me, that is the fun part again, <laughs> and that's the spark. So it must have a purpose and a reason to, to do it. A kind of loss of words <laughs> because I drafted some of the questions yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, I have some so-called uh, imagination of the answers you would reply yeah. but uh, it's like you always have a uh, higher purpose like you doesn't make things like I set this goal and then I achieve it's like everything is like pen and paper but for you it's like I, I just things to help people. Eric, help you're, you're, you're speaking to a retiree that came back <laughs> to do something, to find himself mm. too bored with retirement and come back to do some work. Yeah. When I joined this company, I had friends, they were telling me, Peter, you're going to spoil your reputation because this mm. company is beyond rescue. And I remember vividly telling my friends, saying, you know, what kind of reputation you're talking about? I'm not looking into 
coming to this company, beautifying my resume so that I can go and find another job <laughs> elsewhere. Right? Yeah. I say, I, I come in here, I do my best. If I can save the company, everyone is happy and I'm happy. But if I can't, at least I say I've done my best. To me, it's as long as my conscience is clear, and don't really bother much. You aren't a typical CEO. Uh, I, I tell you, <laughs> I tell you, I mean, it's our record, so I don't want to say too much. <laughs> <laughs> and in yeah. fact, I really say a lot. Mm. To me, if my IRS is around, they always will hold me back from saying a lot of things. Because mm. to me, it's, I'm a straight talker. Mm. They know me for what I am. I would just say the truth, whether it's, it's, it's music or not, but mm. it is what it is. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all this, because these are the life experience and things that I myself will never have this chance to learn about things okay. that you have well, been through. Why is it so bad? I mean, now that I go back, <laughs> like say if I retired again, I no. have so much more new stories to share, right? <laughs> and then, like you watch the drama series, like the Shanghai Tan, all this yes. thing. There was an incident I was leading 300 people going to take back the farm. I would have not imagined myself doing that. Mm. I would not imagine myself in the room in confrontation with the mafia and all this stuff. Oh, because of this, I would have not have all this experience and all this to talk about and laugh over it. And, and to me, I thought these are very valuable things that is fun. Life is always like a journey, and it's like a boat. And I just don't feel that any one of us should have our life book written in one chapter and mm. closed. It should have many different chapters and it should be very colourful. So the day when it's closed, you feel that you, you have lived to the fullest and you have lived with no regrets. Mm. And yeah, that's what it is. To wrap up the... Last thing I'll ask is like, what is the one most important skills that we should have when addressing all these questions that come about? So your question to me, right? Yeah. This is what is the most important thing. Follow your heart, chase, but not the money. The money will come when you follow your heart and chase the dream. At the end of the rainbow, that's where everything will meet. And you see your glory, you see your money, you see your recognitions. But if you go after the recognition, you go after the glory, you go after the, the trophies, and you realize that at the end of the day, you may get it, but the meaning is very different, it's very cool. But when you're not going because of that, but you're going because you just follow your heart and you and you move towards that direction, when you get it, <clears throat> I can guarantee you it's a lot sweeter and it's a lot more meaningful. And you don't have to worry about how to, about meeting ends meets and all this stuff. I'm sure somewhere in life, you all may have heard people saying that, you know, don't chase after money, the money will run further away from you and that kind of stuff. In some ways, it's very true because it's like chase your dream, chase and look in, and you touch your heart and chase a dream. The money, career, the fame, it will come in place whichever you're looking. When I joined this company, then I was not looking at anything. But today, Oceanus is quite popular. Did I ask why? No, I don't even expect it to be like that. I don't even know whether the company has a chance at that point of time, but I just follow my heart and do what I believe in doing, being happy about it in the process. If I'm not happy, I think I will not last so long mm. because I'm being chased by a lot of thugs <laughs> along the way. So, so I'm always very happy. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that. most welcome, That's Harry. one of the most important words that we need at the moment because we are also in a juncture of uh, restructuring our, our company directions and uh, always there's people asking me the questions, how are you guys going to make money? But whenever these questions come in, um, it's like chasing a dream, yeah. Yeah, go for the dream, comes prior you, you, you think about it right when singapore was in the founding state when our, our pioneer leaders was building singapore it was a dream isn't it it was a dream it was a, 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 a mission it was something that they believe really from their heart not only the the the, the, the pioneer leaders including the, the, the i'm not forgetting our ky lee go chop uh, go king Sui, all this even like you know, Philippe, a bunch of them they were able to land on a private job with a higher pay, better career. But it does that in the 60s. But they choose otherwise to, to work in the government which pay a lot lesser and very uncertain kind of career and long hours. But and why they do that? They do that because of a passion. They do it because of a belief. They do that because of they follow their heart. If not because of that, Singapore won't even stand a chance. We got no resources, we got no nothing. And it's about the belief about the people, their belief, and their heart and soul. So this company is exactly that. When guys came in and they worked their butts off. Mm. Not because I, I 
pay them well. Even when Dr. Jakob, this one, I thought I should glorify him to some way because when Dr. Jakob joined my board, my other board members, because those days we all came in because we wanted to help. So I pay my board very little. So I remember when I invited Dr. Jakob, when he just, the news that he's stepping down from politics and I straight away asked him to come. And my other board member called me separately. And each do not know the other is calling me. And they called me saying that, you know, bro, do me a favor, better pay him a bit more. He said it's so embarrassing. If you worry that if you pay him more than what you're paying us, paying me, don't. I'm calling you to let you know that you have my blessing, mm. and please pay him more. Mm. And every other my of my mom did call me up. We both know mm. each other calling me, and all saying more or less the same thing. So I only promised and said, okay, okay. So I brought him out for lunch, and I tell him what happened. Mm. And then he looked at me and say, Peter, you're telling me your other board members. What about yourself? Yes, mm. <laughs> I, I remember telling him. Is it important? So of course it's important. You're the CEO. Whether I joined your company or not, it's because of you. Then I asked him the second question. Do you want an answer? You want it, or you want the truth? Mm. That's a Peter cut the bullshit. In the <laughs> <truth>. <laughs> and I say, I don't think so. I said, I told you I don't think so. And he said, Peter, you mean I'm not worth your money? And look at me in a straight face. I said, no, you're of course worth every cent of it and more. I mean, with someone with your pedigree. But just that this company is built on the backdrop of we coming forward to pay it forward. I just don't feel that one man should come in and change his whole DNA. He look at me and say, Peter, if there's anything else that comes out from your mouth, I will not join your company. So pay me not a dollar more, not a dollar less, just like the rest. So this is a very interesting company, very interesting history, very interesting culture in DNA. Yeah. And that's why we are what we are. In a short time we can go to what we are today. It's resonate with how Singapore did because of that passion, that heart and the, the people and how we all come together. Someone like Yakko had agreed he could join a very big multinational as a boy and people would be happy. Why is he here? Mm. I think that is not about money anymore. It's that that spark that how it makes this company very different from everybody else. Mm -hmm. And if you mark my word, if you continue to grow this way, maybe one day we'll maybe be a multinational. Because to us right now, uh, we are not satisfied with just being a Singapore company. <laughs> we want to be we want to put the red dot out of the world. Yeah. But in fact it's actually you guys have operations at we have, different we have, countries. We have, we have, we have, mm. we have in eleven countries. Mm. Yes we are. But what I'm saying is that Today, if you talk about um, SIA, people heard about it. You talk about Google, people talk about it. Tesla, mm. people heard about it. Not many Singapore companies are in SIA and a few that people know. But we hope that one day, when you mention Oceanus, they know this is a company from Singapore. That's what we hope they do. And then at least I'll say, is that, you know, this journey is damn fun, right? Mm. <laughs> it's like we really kick many asses along the way and we really get to where we are. <laughs> You got your one kick first. <laughs> <laughs> right. You must thank the kick first. Then you're in a position to. Yeah. So, that's why it's. Alright, yep. Thank you, people, yeah, for welcome. all the sharing. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, truly inspiring. And then I'd like to share this to people. You have questions? Yeah, no, yeah. Course. one last question. So, yeah. just to pick up on the point that you mentioned that don't chase after the money, which I think, in overall sense of things, it makes more sense, that, right? Because if you're just chasing money, then it's all about materialistic way of life and then yeah. there's going to be a certain time where you can realise that hey, mm. I really have this amount, it's not going to be thrilling or it's not yeah. going to make me satisfied. Yeah. But coming to the ex coming back to the point where like, you know, as youngsters, right, especially when you just graduated or uh, and, and going to the workforce, the number one thing or the first few priorities that they are thinking is probably I need to start earning money and also um, to, to work, to, to provide better for my family and also yeah, yeah. My, my partner in the near future, right? So. In that essence of things, do you have any like word of advice or don't, something? Don't, don't take me literally as yeah, yeah. I don't chase the no, money, means money. don't need money. <laughs> of course, I mean, we, yeah. we, we, we are living in a very real world. Mm. Even you guys coming to here, you also need transport and that is money as well. Mm. So, so when I say don't chase the money, I don't mean literally we don't need money or we don't chase the money. But what I really mean is that when anything in life when we do, I mean, if we work, there will be pay, there's all these things. But don't take it too hard, as in how much pay you're getting, or how much profit you're getting. 
I mean, you will get something. I mean, you you will probably get something to get by. There's not such things that you know. I'm not saying doing for free and working for free. No, I don't mean that. But follow follow your heart and and your dreams and do something that you strongly believe in. Why I say that? I I've seen many friends that when they do it just for the salary, sometimes they don't enjoy the work. Every day is a drag, and they don't excel. Mm -hmm. Now. Similarly, I see friends that they do things that is really their interest and their hobby, and they, they really enjoy doing it. To them, going to work every day is a fun, is a joy. And strange enough is that they just manage to do better, and they do well because what they're doing is truly from their heart, and and they they'll go the extra mile. Mm -hmm. But when it's just a job, like what you all mentioned, before five o'clock shop go home. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing from the heart, it's like it's it's very passionate. You you go and ask those pioneer leaders in Singapore. They, I'm very sure they will not stop work at five. But sad to say, I mean, today some of the civil servants at five o'clock shop. So so yes. So I heard like four four forty five they repack up already. Mm. So that's the difference. No. So when you're you're talking about if you were doing it in that frame of thought, you probably do a lot better in life. Someone asked Jim Carrey once upon a time, "Is that like, why you do so well?" And his answer is, "I just do what I like, mm -hmm. and do it well, and the rest is history." Mm -hmm. But if you go and chase it for a tangible thing, well, you're still going to get it. But the point is, how far will you go, and how well will you do? It's a different question altogether. And you, at the end of the day, you'll probably be very mediocre because. You are choosing. You are doing it for a wrong purpose and a wrong reason. Mm. But when doing it for the right purpose and the right reason, you probably find that you end up doing things beyond your imagination, and that's where you become the unique one and you stand out from the rest, mm. and, and you make more money than everybody else because you are the only one. You know, you are unique. But when you are going for the money, it's just just like everybody else, and you still make your money, but just like. That's why I say go with your heart. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.